College football nerds are going to discuss the Clemson Tigers in this 2019 season preview. I got Josh with me again. Going to get nerdy with y'all, and we're going to do our best to say Clemson and not Clemson, but we're going to say it every once in a while, so don't kill us in the comments. Uh, I want to remind everybody, if you haven't already, please give us a subscribe and a like on the video. Even if you don't like what we're saying, get mad at us in the comments, but give us a like right beneath the video. Um, all right, Josh, we've had a lot of time to kind of digest the Clemson-Alabama game, and it was... Uh, you know, kind of a fun off season for us because we had a video that, that did pretty well uh, where we kind of broke down that game and then had a live show that did pretty well where we ate some crow. I ate more crow than you did. You're not great at that. You need to work on that. Um, but coming out of sort of the summertime media days discussions was a little bit from Dabo talking about how People say this about Clemson's schedule and or in the past have said things about ACC teams and their schedule and, and, and you know, kind of poo-poo in the fact that they've had a poor schedule in the past. And I, I want to kick this thing off by saying I don't think it matters. We've said this before. We'll say it again. Clemson may or may not have a strong schedule this year. I tend to think that they won't, but I don't think it matters at all. You can be an elite team. You can be the best team in the country and not have a great schedule. Last year, I think they were by far had the lowest rank uh, S&P plus strength of schedule and by far was the best team in the playoffs. So uh, it doesn't matter in my opinion, but do you see something different here? Does, does the schedule matter or, or, or can Clemson just be that good regardless of who they play? I think the whole scheduling issue is really overblown and it's overblown on a lot of levels. One, you've got a lot of Alabama fans that sort of complained about how Clemson had a really easy easy schedule over the course of the year and it let them be healthy. You know, maybe there's some merit to it. I personally though think that's kind of stupid because most of the time those same SEC fans should be talking about how much more battle tested their teams are because they went through the regulars of the SEC and the more prepared in, in a in the playoffs or the bowl season. And frankly, a lot of times, if you look over the past 15, 20 years, teams that played a more difficult slate have been a lot more successful in a championship scenario because they've had more opportunities to play tough, down-to-the-wire games. I, I don't know if having a weak schedule is really a, an advantage or a disadvantage other than maybe it helps you get to the playoff. But regardless, it, it always kind of amazes me that people somehow take it as a slight against their team, that the teams you're playing against are worse. Right. I mean, Alabama is not a worse team if Auburn's terrible. And I think it, but at the same breath that an Alabama fan would tell you how bad Auburn really is three or four weeks into the season, they're all going to scoff when a, if a Clemson fan were to say, OK, well, if they're that bad, then what is it a big deal to beat them? Because they go, right. well, but you don't have to play Auburn like it, you can't have it both ways. Right. I mean, everybody, right. everybody's probably going to look down your list of your schedule and look at the opponents. Like if you want to talk about Florida State or you want to talk about North Carolina or you want to talk about Boston College or NC State, I think most of those teams, if you were going to have a discussion, are like, yeah, they really suck this year. But then you're probably also going to turn around and defend them. None of that's relevant to how good your team is. And Yeah, Clemson can't help that. They can't help that South Carolina sucks this year or will suck this year. Um, that's right, South Carolina fans, you're going to suck this year. Uh, they can't help that. Like Clemson, and that's the other thing that I, I want to stop and give Clemson a lot of credit for, and I'll let you continue. Um Clemson does everything they can. Like, yes, they play in the ACC, and right now it's down, but five years ago it wasn't, and five years from now it probably won't be. But here's what they do. They play two Power 5 teams out of conference. Not every SEC team does that. There's a lot of teams from conferences that play non-conference non game schedule that don't play any Power 5 teams out of conference. Ohio State doesn't this year. Not their fault. TCU backed out. Um, but... For Clemson, they're doing they're doing all they can. They're scheduling two SEC teams out of conference. They're playing what's put in front of them. Tell me this, Josh. Is it less about who you play and more about if you beat the crap out of all of them, we know you're good anyway? Well, obviously that was a loaded question, but it is more <laughs> about how you do. We've talked about that a lot. When you beat up on really bad teams, that still usually means you're good. And... We'd rather usually see you crush mediocre to bad teams than struggle with reasonably good ones. And I know 
it's much to the chagrin of Notre Dame fans multiple times in the past few seasons because they've had a schedule of pretty good teams. Actually, probably one of the most consistently solid schedules, but with very few elite teams. And the problem has been that they struggled in a lot of those games. Um, that, that was the bad sign that, you know, winning close, lots of close games against a reasonably hard schedule. I'd rather you say, play, I, I have more faith in a team that plays an easier schedule but crushes them. Um, and for most of the year last year, it, Clemson wasn't even challenged. Um, and I don't know how much Clemson's going to be challenged this year either. Uh, but yeah, no, it, it, it's definitely important that you, you know, you, you don't obviously play up or play down to the, your opponents. There's some truth to that. It, I think that's a lot more nuanced in terms of scheme and a lot of other things. Uh, but yeah, I mean, you, you, you want to crush a team and that's why a lot of advanced metrics, something like, you know, be it S and P plus, be it our models, they're all going to look at that pretty heavily and they're going to, they're going to really critique you if you're not being able to crush those bad teams. And it almost always comes home to roost. If you're struggling in those games that you're going to have a uh, Miami a couple years ago, right? Where they had some, some mediocre opponents that they, they beat, but not that well. They pointed to their big game, a couple big wins they had. And at the end of the season, all of a sudden they played back down to the level they played early. Um, it, it always turns around if you can't crush bad teams. And we've seen this before in the playoffs. Uh, go, go two minutes on 2014 Ohio state. Yeah, so 2014 Ohio State, there's a tremendous amount of similarities between them and Clemson, and we'll probably, uh, not just last year, but probably also this year and how we're going to talk about it as a prospectus, but 2014 Ohio State lost the second week of the season to Virginia Tech. There were a lot of factors that went into that. They lost their starting quarterback, Braxton Miller, right at the start of the season. They put in JT Barrett. JT Barrett was a red freshman. He had barely ever played. Didn't really know what he was doing. It was a hostile, uh, a, a fairly hostile game environment when you're playing Bud Foster. That game was actually at home, I believe. Um, and they just failed to score the ball. They turned the ball over a bunch. But past that point, Ohio State in 2014 had one of the easiest schedules in recent memory for a team to win a championship. Um, and that was one of the first years that I ran an early version of what our current computer model is. And it actually picked Ohio State to beat Alabama, even though Alabama was a 10-point favorite, I believe, in that game. And the reason for it was simply Ohio State wasn't even being touched against their easy schedule. And they were killing people. And yeah, it was easy. And all the SEC fans were crowing about how how easy Ohio State's schedule was, and now they're going to play a real team, et cetera, et cetera. It's like, well, you know, whether or not you played a hard team or an easy team doesn't suddenly make you bad or good at football. What makes you bad or good at football is if you're bad or good at football. Uh, and an Alabama team that had struggled to score against good defenses all year struggled to score against Ohio State. And an Ohio State team that had been able to just obliterate anything in its path got slowed down somewhat, but still was able to rampage offensively uh, in the playoff and the title game. So, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of similarities, but I think they go beyond that too, right? Because 2014 Ohio State, that did play an easy schedule, that did peak at the end of the year, blow teams out of the water, turned around in 2015 with an extremely loaded roster, and then stumbled a little bit. And I think a lot of the curiosity is going to be, and it, to be clear, it's a completely unfair comparison, how much Clemson this year is going to compare to 2015 uh, Ohio State. And if they fall to the same stumbling blocks that have tripped up so many other teams with so many great returning starters and so much talent in the past. And I don't think it's unfair for us to say that the ACC is not great this year. Again, not Clemson's fault. And we don't have to go back that far in the past to find a year where they were great, where they were, I think they were the best conference in the country like three years ago. Like it, it happens fast. Florida state falls off fast. Uh, Miami doesn't ever really get back to where they need to be. And that's not Clemson's fault, but is there some evidence, maybe anecdotal evidence to kind of support us on the fact that the ACC isn't very good this year beyond just us saying it? I mean, there's just, it's hard to point to a whole lot. I think a lot of the preseason stuff's going to point to Syracuse. I think Syracuse is good, but at the same end of the day, top to bottom talent matters tremendously. And you can be good and build a system, and they, they have good coaching, and they've got a good scheme, but they just don't have the horses in the trenches to go with a major team. Beyond that, and when you go down the roster in the ACC, it's just hard to point to any particular team and say why any of them um, 
is going to be good. And and I think that's sort of shown out when you look at what the preseason metrics look like and what preseason projections look like. Uh, uh, something I thought was kind of interesting. If you look at Lindy's preseason All-American ranking, and they're not unique in this, but it's uh, I bought the magazine and brought it home so I could read it while, while we were talking to reference it. Of the offensive starters, first team, not just all ACC, but first team all ACC offense, seven of 11 are from Clemson. And when you discuss football with a lot of teams and a lot of fans, it's really hard for them to understand that their star player at X position is probably not the best player in college football, and it's probably not the best player in their own conference. I mean, most teams, they all have relative strengths and weaknesses. It's a highly variable sport. You can be really, really good at a certain position, and you're probably still not going to be the best at that position. Clemson was is considered to be the best at their position at 7 of 11 positions on offense. And what that says is twofold. One, it's how good Clemson is, but it also speaks to the fact that there really aren't a lot of guys of comparable quality on the other, you know, from from other teams. I mean, when you you go look at like who's the second string and the third string all ACC quarterbacks, I mean, I I don't know, Daniel I mean, do you do you think you could even like take a shot at it? Could you name who the second string and third team string all ACC quarterbacks are this year? Um, kid at Virginia, which I is is getting a lot of hype. Um, that's the that's the only other quarterback I can think of. I'm sorry. It's, I, mean, it's, I, mean, I mean, you're right. So it's it's Bryce Perkins at Virginia, and the third is Tommy DeVito at Syracuse, and. We don't know who's going to start at Miami. Um, I, I think I think QB one may may get win the starting job because uh, again, unlike you know Lincoln Riley said earlier this week that you don't we're not just given a guy that transfers in the, the starting role, but it's not a great look if you go out and basically recruit a guy and have him come in uh, and transfer and then you put him on the bench. So uh, I think Tate Martell might be the starter at. at at Miami, but I, there's no reason to think that he's going to be great. Um, you lose a good, good quarterback at NC State, so there's a lot of talent walking out the door. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't think there's a ton of quarterback talent in the ACC right now, at least prove it. Right, and and the point there is, as good as Clemson is, there there's a pretty significant gap with the rest of the teams in the conference. And there's just... It's kind of incredible, really, that when you look at... Not to say that DeVito and Perkins are terrible by any means, but Perkins and DeVito aren't going to make the list in most conferences, right? I mean, these these guys are, are solid quarterbacks, but they're not... You're, you're talking all conference, right? I mean, these should be NFL prospects. And most conferences have multiple NFL prospects at, at the quarterback position, and and these are the guys you got second and third string, and it's it's kind of true across the conference. I mean, guys like Des Fitzpatrick at Louisville is he a good player? Sure, <laughs> should he be third string all conference? I'm not so sure about that. So it it's telling one just how good Clemson is, and then two, it also it I mean it is a direct indicator of how far off the rest of the conference is compared to Clemson. That Clemson is basically gobbled up every. Every possible, you know, all conference slot you you could take, and again, you know, the one of the Clemson linemen is actually third string all ACC. So eight of the eleven are, are landing on an all ACC conference selection. It's pretty insane. Yeah, and again, that's not. Um, and I know because we have some SEC roots, the, the Clemson fans look at everything that we say. With with a jaundice eye, but that that whole little segment we did on the ACC is not a shot at Clemson. It's just to show how far ahead they are from everybody else. Um, and I think if you drop them in most other conferences, it's a similar situation. Maybe not the Big Ten or the SEC, but definitely in 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 the Pac-12, I think you'd have a similar situation. So um, it, it's not a shot at Clemson. More to say, just kind of how great they are. Um, but being great comes with some negativity, I guess. You could say it's negativity or some hardships. Nick Saban's always been harping on this through his run at Alabama about how hard it is to um, sort of sustain success. And it's it's he even said that at Media Days. I was watching an interview with him. 
uh, how it's so much harder to prepare players to sustain sustain success and as than it is to go out and get success. Um, is Clemson feeling some of that? I, I notice a lot of people are still complaining about PEDs, which I think look small small rant moment if you'll grant it to me. <sighs> This is ridiculous. The whole like complaining about performance enhancing drugs at Clemson because of the one random thing that happened uh, in the playoffs last year to Dexter Lawrence is is kind of ridiculous. Um, because what we see, we've seen it with other teams, SEC, Southern Cal. I know Southern Cal was cheating with Reggie Bush, but that's a different story. Rival fans take one little thing when you get to the top. And they try to use that thing to explain away a decade of toiling to get to that success. And I think it's freaking ridiculous. You can't look at one little thing like, oh, this little PED pop and say, okay, well, oh, they're cheating. Therefore, nothing they've done counts. I've seen some South Carolina fans do it. South Carolina fans, you need to stop. Um, I've seen some Alabama fans do it. It's ridiculous because there's there's so much that Clemson has done to build this program to get to this point that they can't have one tiny thing kind of explain away all their success. It's a pet peeve of mine. It's really kind of like what we saw with Alabama earlier this week where it's not really about the PEDs. It's about you finding an excuse not to give the champion their due because it's harder to acknowledge when your rival has bested you than it is to explain away success. Um I'll get off my soapbox on that, but do you see possibly Clemson having some issues with either attrition or dealing with success that they maybe haven't had in the past because they've been able to keep teams and coaches and players together um, and finally have reached the top? So I think Clemson's probably a lot better position to deal with this than a lot of other teams, and I think it's because of the culture they've created, frankly. Dabo Sweeney, to his credit, has created a very collegial, I hate the word collegial, but a culture that has a lot of uh, camaraderie and positivity within the program. And they have fun. And I think so long as they're being successful, and as so long as the kids are having fun doing what they're doing, and especially so long as they recruit a certain type of player that plays a certain type of way, they're going to be successful. And you can say... I think Clemson and Alabama approach things from a very different perspective, but kind of get the same result that Alabama handpicks their guys because they kind of say, Hey, you're going to come in and you're going to have to compete to win. We're not going to guarantee you a slot, but if you compete, we're going to make you successful. And the guys that join their program tend to be guys that are amenable to that pitch. And the ones that go, you know, I don't want to work that hard. Don't go to Alabama. And that's why Alabama's uh, success rate with like, you know, uh, Five stars starting in their first round draft picks is about 50%. It's much higher than the rest of college football. You know, the other team that also has a percentage that's about the same number, and that's Clemson. Now, their approach is very different. I mean, they don't have the sort of hard, cold, mechanistic approach that Alabama's had for so long, which I think Alabama, by the way, is having to adjust to be like Clemson now. But what Clemson has said is, you know, we're going to recruit a certain kind of kid. We're going to look at your background. We're going to look at your character. We're not going to recruit you unless you, we think you fit the mold for personality. And Clemson's been consistently very selective in that regard. They've been able to build a culture of guys that have a lot of accountability. Uh, and uh, they've had a lot of high-character individuals. And that group of players in the front seven that that is now departed are pretty legendary for the way they carry themselves. And that... Like, look, there's a lot of ways people talk about things and how it affects it and, and you know, how important character is and... You can call it esoteric, but I mean, it's 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 really quite physical and it's quite pragmatic. I mean, if you've got guys of high character that show up for workouts that actually care about studying the playbook, you know, that has an effect on your team. And in any group environment, the more of a critical mass you reach with that, uh, the better it is. Now, you did lose a lot of leaders. Is it possible that changes? Sure. Do we have any reason to believe it's going to change? No, not really. Um, it's always a lot more difficult to carry over one year to the year prior, uh, the, the next year rather. I mean, again, 2014 Ohio State, almost all those guys came back in 2015 and they weren't nearly as good. And there's really no clear reason why that was other than they just weren't very focused. Um, you know, Alabama's most talented team ever is probably 2010 when they lost three games. And it was 
the most Saban's lost since his first year. Um, and, you know, why is that? Well, they, you know, that team probably didn't really, uh, they were, they were kind of divas. And according to everything that everyone ever heard at that point in time, uh, Alabama won titles 11 and 12, and then their 13 team was, had all kinds of personality issues. So, um, the problem, one thing is we've, all the examples in recent years have been Alabama because Alabama's win most of the titles. Um, We've seen Clemson be successful, but in an every other year sort of standpoint. But they've been the kids have been hungry, I, so yeah, I don't I don't necessarily buy that it's such a big deal like people talk it out to be. To me, it's more about you know the positivity of their culture that that's going to hold it too. But in all these examples, when you talk about all these teams and their failings, I think what usually gets missed is they lose certain players and that has an effect. You know the the twenty ten Alabama example. Um, you know, why did they fall off? Well, it was actually probably more due to injury in that, that year than anything else. And I think maybe the next step to talk about is one, we've already sort of established this. And it, and I, I think we were sort of comparing Clemson to the ACC and I want to make really clear. It's important to compare Clemson to the rest of the ACC, because if you're going to talk about how successful Clemson is, the first thing to address is the elephant in the room. Clemson's a lot better than the rest of the ACC. And the first thing you got to do to go to the playoff is win your conference. There's a very, very good likelihood Clemson does that because... Unless you're Alabama. <laughs> say what? Unless you're Alabama. Yeah, well, <laughs> fair enough. The 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 first thing you got to do, though, is, right, you got to beat the teams in your schedule. The ACC being down has a significant impact on how likely Clemson is to make the playoff. A lot probably more likely than anybody else. But depth is going to be an issue when you get to the playoffs. And then when you lose players, I think in a lot of these seasons... When you get teams that return a lot of talent or they had really good young players that stepped up, I think a lot of times it's the second and third strings that have been impacted. And I think the last couple of years, it's really negatively impacted Alabama, especially last year, that Alabama had a lot of really good, talented young players and they got hurt and they had nobody behind them. Because those guys that were the second string or third string players, when they, you know, two or three years ago, well, they became starters and they were ready to play. But the third or fourth string guys, when they had to step up, they weren't they weren't good enough. So sometimes, I think too, when you have these really good teams and they step up, it's not really, you know, they may return a layer of players, but at some level you've lost depth. And a lot of the the struggles from teams coming back year after year has been that the depth was impacted due to injury and uh, other extrinsic situations. Yeah, we saw this with Georgia after they had their, you know close loss against Alabama in the national championship game. That was a very senior laden, very deep team. And they lost a lot of leaders and a lot of depth. And then, you know, they came back and were still a good team, but they weren't as good in my opinion. Um, tell me this, you know, you talk about depth. I felt like, and you can completely correct me on this. Uh, if I'm wrong, I felt like one of the big differences between Clemson and Alabama in that game last year and that season last year is that Clemson can lose a Dexter Lawrence and not have their defense fall completely off the rails. Because one of the things they did a really, really good job of last year is develop depth, especially in their front seven on defense, rest guys, bring guys in that maybe weren't ready for prime time and maybe would, uh, you know, contribute to having not as possibly as clean of a final score because they were in there, but they developed depth and it paid dividends at the end of the year. Alabama, you know, Christian Miller getting hurt in the Oklahoma game really hurt their pass rushing capabilities, but they also had very little developed depth on the defensive line. And this isn't to say, this isn't to excuse again, to excuse the win for Clemson away, but to say that, Clemson won that game because they did a lot of things as a as a system, as a set of coaches and the decisions they made throughout the year and in that game to win that game. And I felt like they developed depth better than Alabama did. Is that something that you think might pay dividends this year? Or is it you can only develop so much depth as a backup and you don't really know what you've got in your start frontline guys until they're out there, you know, with their feet in the fire you know, as a starter. We hear this a lot, right, that you develop the depth with these guys. I, I've i never really known how much it plays out because I've seen so many elite teams in this situation where their guys step up and they either play well or they don't. And it, it doesn't, it never really feels to me that much like the amount of reps you get 
helps you one year to the next. I think it's really important within a season, but at the end of the day, the guys that are going to be starters this year have been starters through spring. They're going to be starters for the spring. They're going to be starters in summer workouts. They'll be starters all through fall camp. I mean, they get a lot of reps as starters to get them prepared. And, and having some game experience is very important. And I, I would say particularly things like quarterback. I think it's really important that your quarterback gets some exposure because uh, the first time you go out there and throw a football in a live game is kind of a different deal at certain positions. But particularly for like linemen, it's important that they get a little bit of exposure, and I think it does help them. But at the end of the day, they're just going to be, I think, kind of what are what they are. Um, and you know. Yeah, I'll sort of transition to another point there that's a little bit related. It's going to be interesting to me to see what Clemson's second and third string looks like because I think something we forget, on the front seven, Clemson's defense has been the same, really, for several years. And they've rebuilt in a few different ways. They've rebuilt the secondary over the course of a couple years. The offense has been completely rebuilt, and they've lost all those guys and got new guys back, and it been at an even higher level than they were before but the rock of this defense for the past two two national titles from Clemson were basically the same guys if, if you look at the Clemson depth chart in 2016 starting DN was Austin Bryant okay starting defensive tackle was Car- Carlos Watkins or Albert Hungen, Huggins Christian Wilkins was the other defensive tackle Dexter Lawrence was a backup Cleland Farrell was the starter at defensive end uh, in, the, in the middle linebacker slots you had Kendall Joseph backed up by Trey Lamar it was the same guys. I mean, they, they lost a couple guys and they were really good, right? I mean, O'Daniel and Bulware were certainly very, very good players. But the point being, you know, that's three years. And that's very, un, very, very uncommon in college football. The, the same defensive line largely that started in 2016 would also start in 2017, would also start in 2018. Three years of continuity. I mean, the assumption is that a lot of these guys that have been getting a lot of snaps are going to be really good, but I, I think it is kind of an interesting quirk that there's a lot more turnover than we've seen in years. And I think there's a weird misconception that Clemson's rebuilt on the front, uh, their, their front defensively in the past few years, um, and that they've been able to completely rebuild. I've heard that a lot. They've re- rebuilt before. Well, what they really did is they rebuilt from the prior group, which was Vic Beasley, and they rebuilt with this 2016 line. There's a pretty solid argument that the 2016 class or that 2016 crop crop that won them the title in 2016 is one of the greatest crops of front seven players in college football history. And they basically won two titles off that group. So it's asking a lot for the backups to come into those shoes. And I don't think they have to replace them completely, particularly because of how good the offense should be, but also because they've got a lot of, you know, just talented players in general But, uh, you know, I don't think there's any way you can prepare guys to replace someone that wasn't just a really good player in guys like Clear and Farrell. That was a freaking three-year starter and a national title winner two years prior to the, you know, then the uh, the 2018 season. There's no really no way to prepare somebody to to replace an individual like that. Yeah, I will kind of quickly turn this back around to you and say – how big of a benefit, let's say for argument's sake, they do have another season where they coast through most of their games and blow everybody out. How big of a benefit is that if, let's say, some of the replacements aren't at prime time level, that they're basically sophomores when it comes time for a game that might be in question in the playoffs? Well, I think it's hugely important, right? I mean, the more you get them, again, I, I said that I don't know how much it matters year to year, right? How much that they played as backups last year, I don't mean, I'm not sure that it's hugely important this year, but I do think within the season it's pretty important. So then the more those guys get exposure this year, the more able they're going to be to step in. Because like you said, I think one of the biggest things that hurt Alabama last year is they had some really, really super talented, you know, five-star, like a Yabi Anoma, I think was like the number one player in the country, and didn't even play the guy uh, in the national title when they didn't have a single pass rusher. And you've got the top pass rusher in the country as a true freshman – it's not like anything else was working, but they hadn't done anything to really develop the kid, and they paid for that. So I think the the more you can do that within the season, the better. All right, so this is a preview show, and we like to kind of put our neck out there and do our season predictions. Um, so give me your number one key for Clemson in this season. 
uh, and and tell me what you think their season's going to look like. I really think the number one key for Clemson this season is that they've got to keep the three players that made their year last year healthy. And those three players were Trevor Lawrence, Justin Ross, and Higgins. And ETN carried them through most of the season. We, you know, we've, we've sort of talked off, offline about this. It, it, we almost felt like we were rope-a-doped because we, we really missed in the national title prediction, and there were, there were signs we didn't see. Clemson was able to bully most of the teams in their ground game all year. But when they got in that Notre Dame game and they got in that Alabama game, they didn't run the ball very effectively. You know, they, they really, their average ended up being pretty solid because the last couple drives, when Alabama just gave up and pulled their starters, they ran the ball well. But to that point, I think they were averaging about three, three and a half yards of carry in that game. They killed Alabama with a deep passing game. And they killed Notre Dame with a deep passing game. And we'd seen, again, seen sprinkles of it. That's how they blew the Florida State game open. That's how they kept ahead of South Carolina in that game. They'd shown the ability to do it, but we had no idea that it was overly consistent. And I think regardless of how the rest of the season goes, I think Clemson really, it's pretty horrible to say a team can coast through their schedule and win, but I think they're about at that point. They can lean on the ground game and win about every game on their schedule for the most part. They're, they're a lot more talented on the offensive line. They return most of their offensive line starters. They've got a great tailback in ETN. But when push came to shove against really good teams, they weren't quite at the level where they could impose their will that way. What they were able to do was lean on those three players that are all, I, I don't think really in my mind, there's no doubt that Ross, Higgins, and Lawrence are all first-round draft picks. But more than that, I mean, there's a potential that they could be all be like number one at their position, right? Those guys have got to stay healthy because I think if you go back to last year, if they didn't have Ross, the, those Notre Dame and Alabama games are going to look completely different. And if they didn't have Higgins where they could double Ross, it's going to look completely different. And I, yeah, I know they've got a lot of other and weapons. we saw the Syracuse game without Trevor Lawrence. Right, same deal. Same deal without Trevor Lawrence. So those three guys have got to stay healthy. And that's true of a lot of elite teams. But you know, I think there's something to be said that if they've got those three guys and they're healthy, as long as there's not an absolute disaster, from what we saw at the end of last year, they've got an ace in their hole that will work against anybody in college football, and they're going to have more than a puncher's chance regardless of what the rest of the situation is and regardless of who their losses are on the defensive side of the ball or anything else in a playoff scenario. Um, so that's, that's to me, the key to their season. Um, and it, it's kind of weird because I don't even think it's the key to go undefeated, but it's more they could lose Ross and Higgins and I think still easily go 12-0, and but they're not going to win the playoff in that scenario. So that's what they're going to need to win the playoff. Um, and, and, and from that, again, I mean, it kind of gives it away. I think they're going 12-0. and I don't think Texas A&M is going to be as good as some people seem to think this year. I think they're going to take a significant step back. Um, I, I don't see any reason why the ACC is going to be more able to challenge them this year, let me put it that way, than they were last year. Uh, and as you said, I don't necessarily see South Carolina being so good that they can challenge them. So it really is – it really is a playoff discussion unless something goes wrong. Uh, and then where do they turn in the playoffs? It, it, it's hard to say. I, I think Alabama seems to be the one team poised to play at their level. Uh, and, you know, maybe another team. I think LSU is a significant sleeper this year. I think they could be quite good. Now, we I mean, maybe the two of us don't completely agree on that at 100%. But, um the end of the day, when you want to win a national title and you talk about playoff, I mean, you can talk about the regular season, but your outcome's more predicted by what other people do than what you do, right? And there's a lot of discussions right now. There's this whole media thing with with how Dabo's handled the win and how Saban's handled the loss. And Saban, I think, is pr- kind of misdirected, obviously, in his rhetoric when he talked about what what they've been doing wrong. And they kind of it comes off as excuses, but I'll give him a little bit of credit in one regard, which is... I think Saban also recognizes the fact that the only thing that he can control is how his own team performs. And that's all Dabo Sweeney can control. But at the same time, whether or not you win a title is more dependent upon who you play. The Alabama team that Clemson beat pretty badly last year is likely to be a a fair amount better this year. There's most indications when you break down their team, they're probably going to be better this year than they were last year. If this year's Clemson team had been the year prior or had, had come into being this year, Alabama certainly wins the national title last year. 
And the only reason they didn't win it was Clemson was in the way. So the biggest thing that's standing in Clemson's way really is just going to be if there's somebody else out, out there in college football that's at another worldly level, I think. Um, I, I'm not really concerned about complacency. I do think injury is a significant concern. Um, I do think the front seven is probably not going to be dominant enough where they can just win every game by default. So you could have more of an off day, whereas last year they were so good on the front seven, it when the other team can't run the ball and they don't have time to pass, it's it's really hard to ever be able to sneak up and beat you. You know, Maybe that's more of a danger this year. Uh, but at the end of the day, I, I really think that the the only thing that can you know the only thing that could go wrong for Clemson is that something going really really right for somebody else. And outside that, um, you know they they got I don't know, maybe a coin flip chance of, of winning the national title with Alabama, probably more than that. Uh, but it, it's hard to say. Yeah, I'm I'm kind of with you on this. I I think that short of a Trevor Lawrence injury um or something catastrophic happening where they have a few key players i've definitely got them in the playoffs um i think the the first round matchup would be interesting i do think they had a better draw or an easier draw than alabama in terms of how the teams match up last year uh so i I, i'll be interested in that but um i don't think complacency matters unless you're complacent and you face a team that's really good and like you, I don't think a and is going to be great this year. Uh, I do think that it's Clemson has done no favors that they have to open with Georgia Tech, um, who we don't really know what we're going to get, and it's a hard team to prepare for, and then play Texas A&M right after that. Uh, so I, I think that's, that's a little bit challenging. Um, but – Otherwise, I don't see any landmines in their schedule. I don't think the Coastal is going to be very good this year. Um, th- there is some renewed optimism with Miami, but um, I, I don't I don't see it. Um, Virginia might end up winning the Coastal this year. Um, so it's really going to be what they do in the playoffs. And like you, I think right now, if we're doing odds, I do think, I, I think, again, it's a coin flip. And honestly, until we see an Alabama defense that can get pressure on a quarterback, I think the coin flip is in favor of Clemson because the big reason why Alabama's secondary injuries had such an impact on that team last year when, when Trayvon Diggs went, went down is they didn't have a good pass rush, and it didn't really show up until the, uh, the Georgia game. It didn't really show up until the Georgia game. Uh, that they didn't have a great pass rush, but that's what made their secondary look so bad against Clemson is they weren't getting to Trevor Lawrence. And the one thing you want to do against a freshman quarterback on that kind of stage is put pressure on him. And they couldn't put pressure on him. Part of that, obviously, is, is Clemson has a good offensive line, but also part of it is Alabama didn't have a good pass rush all year, even against a bad team. So until we see what we think is going to be a good pass rush from Alabama, but we don't know, with you know Lewis back and Allen back and, and, and having some of these players – until we see it, it's hard to put that in Alabama's favor or give them any kind of nod. So right now, if I had to put money on it, I'd probably pick Clemson to, to win the national championship, in the least, uh, because it's ridiculous to pick where they're going to be in January of 2020. In the least, I think it's safe money to see them in the playoffs uh, again this year. And beyond that, uh, I do think it, it, it's it's so hard to speculate because, like you said, injuries and things like that. So, uh, all right, give us one more thing. Um, if if Clemson wins another national championship second in a row, is it going to be because that front seven ended up being as deep as you know the one before, and and that's why they win it, or would it be something else? I mean, I think that's probably the answer. I, I said those, well, there's two things. One, one, it's going to be that the trio of Lawrence, Higgins, and Ross stays healthy. I, I really think that's very important. And then two, yeah, it, it's going to be that those guys stand up. I mean, some of those, Xavier Thomas, uber-talented recruit, the only reason he wasn't playing was he had a ton of awesome guys in front of him. But that's still in theory. I mean, they've got to pan out, and they've got to play at a high level. Um, yeah, I, I think it's going to be the, the health of those three and then it's going to be the front seven. Now, I think it's it's funny. We have in this preview show, but I think we're both also 
have in the back of our minds that maybe we'll do something for Clemson, Texas A&M on the preview. Um, but other than that, it's hard for me to even look at the schedule and say we're, we'll probably do some Clemson previews just for the sake of it. But I, I don't know. I, I imagine they're going to be more than a double digit favorite in our minds in every game all year up until the playoff. And that's going to be problematic for us as data hounds, because when we get to the playoff, we're not going to know what team we've got in, in Clemson. And I say all that to say, if you say like what, what makes them win the playoff or what doesn't make the playoff. And I think it's just going to be, can they sustain the performance that they're going to have through most of the season in the playoffs? Or are they going to have some sort of weak link that we're going to, everybody in the media is probably rightly going to have to nitpick all year that shows up at the last minute in a semifinal or a final game that, you know, never was able to be exposed. And before they can correct it, uh, ends up losing them the game. I, and that's, you know, I think that's going to be the ultimate question. Yeah, we had to do some of that last year. I think we did Clemson BC when we knew that was going to be uh, not a close game. All right, y'all, that's our probably longer than expected Clemson 2019 preview. Uh, obviously, since uh, we know who Clemson is, we, we will try to go in a few different directions and and bring some interest in other places. But if y'all would like for us to talk about a topic related to your Clemson Tigers, or if you're not a Clemson fan, just the Clemson Tigers, let us know in the comments what you'd like for us to talk about in lieu of a game when they're going to steamroll somebody. We've got plenty of time before the season to make some videos and discuss them, and obviously we'll have time throughout the year to talk about Clemson, and if they're one of the best teams in the country, we want to talk about them. I uh, want to remind everybody to please subscribe, hit that notification bell. If you haven't, give us a like too, giving you some homework to do. Let us know in the comments what you think Clemson's 2019 season is going to look like. Give us a record. Give us a score if you think you know what the score of the national championship game is going to be. Uh, thanks so much, y'all. Have a great week, and God bless.